So welcome everybody to Talking Horticulture. Um, this week we're in Renute in St. Patrick's College and we're going for a walk about and we're looking at wildflowers and meadows. So myself and Michael have a cup of coffee and we're taking a walk through the wildflower meadows. What do you think Michael? Yeah, well, we had a look at biodiversity before in one of our earlier podcasts but this time we're, as we said at the time, we come back and focus on different parts of it. So this time we're looking at wildflower meadows. And as you said, we're just walking through them here now at the minute. And the piece we're in is, is uncut and to my left is cut. So we're we're in the middle of a meadow that's been allowed grow since about uh, last spring and it's had no interaction bar a winding we're on the winding meandering path. We look a bit that, odd walking through this path, you know that? A bit strange, the two of us, yeah. Yeah, because there's a perfectly good path over here that we could probably so <laughs> we're, we're getting off the meandering path because it looks like yes, we're, we do. We look like we're on a romantic, romantic, walk, romantic, romantic walk yeah so we're just looking at this the difference between the mode v unmode so the area to our left is a vast bit of ground that is about i think it's about 20 acres in size and it's completely it was allowed to grow as a meadow but now it's nearly all grass there's there's very little flowers left in it, wildflowers. Now there was great flowers in it when, when we allowed it but we got the farming contractor in to cut it back and bale it. So when you when you say that there was there was great flowers in it, did you plant? Was there stuff planted here or was it just what came up naturally when it grew itself? So yeah this is the thing that, that we're looking at is the the don't mow let it grow approach that we're not doing any areas that we are going to be planting seed intentionally we're going to be looking at the seed base that's that is um of kildare and what is in the seeds what's under the soil now and allowing it to flourish so these are in their second year these meadows and last year we had a great we had a good a good lot of flowers and even this year we had twice as much so i'm expecting them to be even better next year so i've seen a patch of wildflowers which were sown today um, and growing, it was a, a variety of stuff. There, there was sunflowers in it. There was cosmos. There was, but they they wouldn't be naturally found growing in, this, in 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 a meadow like this. No. So this is the this is the contentious issue with wildflower meadows is that if you are choosing a, a, a seed mix that is that would never be found anywhere else anywhere else together that is, it's a man-made. Um, and draw clump of, of seeds and plants uh -huh. that uh, that would never be found together in the in the in, in nature whereas the approach that, that i'm taking here is that i'm allowing whatever is in the seed base to come up and to flower and it's what natural to this area so, so you will see no sunflowers come up here no i'm seeing a lot of creeping buttercup here and dandelions and that time and then just the different different varieties of grass did, did you have much problems with these? So the only thing that we're actually controlling in these meadows at the moment is ragwort. So we will go out and we'll hand pick the ragwort out of all these meadows because it's not, the farmer won't take the, the stuff with ragwort in it. It is a noxious weed in the noxious weed act as well. It so is a noxious weed, yeah. It is, it is your obligation or, or any farmer or open space to remove it. So like when you, when you look at this area that we're standing in that's mowed and you say it's just grass but like you said when you start to look down at the different uh, plants that are there there's a lot of creeping buttercup there's a lot of plants that are here within the sward of grass that are going to be um, come up and flower next year so we cut this back in start of September I think and it's been mowed two or three times then with our with a, with, a, with a topper on the back of a tractor but the first time you did it you lifted the grass off it you didn't, so you, we, didn't you don't leave it behind you've so taken it away yeah we, we bailed it for for haylage right so um yeah so that was bailed and sent off and some happy farmer is now feeding it to his cattle and now what's what, what's here at the minute can be just clipped and chopped back into it because it's short it doesn't need to be lifted off at a such no 
no we're just mulching the back into the ground so we have we've we've removed the vast majority of the the nutrients by getting it baled and taking the the larger sword of grass and and, and and plants off it and being fed to animals but now we're just allowing this to just kind of uh, rot back down into the soil and mulch it so, so. it rather for other sort of word but it likes crap soil do wildflowers prefer when the soil is that bit rougher don't they yeah so the lower the nutrients level the better right, right. they like they like crappy subsoil rubbish that the lower the nutrients the better your your wildflower meadow meadow will be because grass is a hungry plant like grass is a plant that thrives on nutrients and it's it's a bit of a bully grass isn't it so this soil here would probably be nearly too good right now yes so this this would have been this would have been intensively mowed for probably the past 50 60 years and then before that it would have been um grazed by sheep okay so they, they would have got a sheep in here and they would have grazed it and kept the level down over the summertime. So now this is kind of the first time it's ever been brought around to this sort of a regime as such on it. Yeah, so it's it's kind of, it, we're ticking a lot of boxes in terms of we're not running as many machines on it. We're not having to interact with it uh, on a weekly basis. We're only coming and cutting the strips, the pathways through it every week rather than cutting the whole area for grass. And it's also a massive area for biodiversity. Like the amount of um, butterflies and bees and pollinating insects that come into this area are absolutely phenomenal. I think we'll take a wander over to the area that hasn't been cut, where we allowed yeah. kind of. Um, Look at that. So what about the likes of litter then? Because some parks and open spaces that local authorities do have a huge problem with litter. But the litter builds up in the long grass and it's kind of. The, it's hard for those out picking to even notice it because it gets buried into the long grass. Yeah, like I do find it's it's if you if you have it under control that you kind of are doing litter picks and keeping on top of it. I don't think it's a massive problem to be honest. I think it's it's quite a quite a small issue in our in our point of view. And um, like we're looking at this area, it's probably. 10 acres of ungrown and uh, um, un uncut meadow at the moment and i don't see one bit of rubbish in it do you no no not I one bit. i suppose it depends on your location as well there's quite a nice selection of stuff here growing in this thing so yeah so everything has gone over essentially um we're looking at the the nap weed here that's kind of just going over now and the seed heads are starting to disperse in the soil and um, but the majority of stuff the majority of flowering plants would have had their time in may june july what do you think of the we're looking that back on it and the kind of the larger stuff we're looking at thistles and we're looking at docks what do you think of them uh to leave in it or take out of it yeah what's your approach the thistles that i i don't know whether is with their with their flower whether they i'm i don't know whether they're good for for bees or not they are they are good they're good for pollinators but the problem docks, with them problem. Yeah. the docks are good for the the yeah, couple of different birds. types of docks there. yeah yeah so i would be if i if i had the if i had the time and money i'd be going and probably taking the the docks and thistles out of it because i find that they they take away from the overall aesthetic of the of the meadows it makes it look a little bit uh uncamped or un very unkept would you say and um, yeah it's a bit it's a bit wild i suppose you're one like we are i wouldn't say we're rewilding but we're kind of allowing nature to thrive but reducing our practices that we're still managing to a certain extent because i still think they need to be managed they do because even as you said there about the packs it allows people to to walk through them and, and kind of get a better a better feel for what you're doing rather than that it's just an area that's been let grow wild as such and um it's not for every place like it really you need to pick you need to pick areas that are suitable to to grow meadows like you can't be allowing you can't be allowing every blade of grass just to grow just because it's good for biodiversity it's not for every spot no it's not it, like as i was mentioning there with issues with the likes of of litter of antisocial behavior in areas where the grass just gets out of control 
that's not going to work in every you, you're in a lucky position here where it's quite quiet it's off the beaten track but i've seen ones where with major issues where you have dog fouling as well in them and then no one's able to get in and and actually use that as it's as it's, it's the only way you yeah. did yeah the way to to use that so that this is an issue with uh with getting an agricultural contractor in to cut these meadows on a large scale they're quite particular on what they will and won't take we wouldn't call this premium uh silage or haylage that's coming off this this, no. this wouldn't be the stuff that is selling at top dollar this would be stuff that people might buy for a bit of a bargain almost yeah i would say because it's probably left until some of it's gone if you have an awful lot of dead grass in it which is not what every you know someone feeding it to, to livestock probably is looking for you know and, and most guys who would be baling it would maybe spray off an area of silage to get rid of the likes of these thistles you have here so yeah if an agriculture if a farmer came in an agricultural farmer came into this area and was solely looking just to take silage off of it he'd be coming in and he'd be putting on a selective glyphosate weed killer for yeah. broadleaf weeds to get rid of all the the the, the docks all the creeping buttercups the thistles they don't want any of that no, that they is don't want that because the likes of these thistles here now they pierce a the silage bale when it's being wrapped because they're so hard they don't bend they don't chop up overly well sometimes and and they're not obviously going to be the most palatable to whatever is going to eat it so but a, but a lot of places a lot of farmers are are doing it for the likes of the county councils and doing it for the um like the phoenix park for example the uh, castletown house myself like there is farmers that are willing to come in and take this it is it is some value oh it is uh, now as some of them are actually lifting it as as loose material taking it away with the zero grazer machine and and doing it um but obviously for someone maybe the likes of our listeners that's going to be on a massive scale compared to what someone might be at at home but this is something that somebody could do in their garden at home really isn't it and how do you think they, they would do it would you would you tell them to go at it if they had a garden about like a a 10 by 10 garden would, would you send them out with a strimmer no i well, i think you'd probably want quite a good large more. Gar- a large garden that you can fit the space into as well to allow a good area of space to to go wild i think wouldn't you really and then yeah. maybe mow as you have a mowing edge around the edge of it so that you can see that it it looks like it needs to be, to be it needs to be kept tidy so we're we're just standing on a on a footpath a tarmac path here and we've mowed about a four foot margin in from the edge and it keeps it looking a bit managed it looks a bit a bit more that that winding path that we were walking on as well that kind of makes it look like you're interested in it as such yeah it is I, and i kind of like the idea of and we might try it out next year is doing a bit more of a tiered mowing approach that you can see we've cut this very tight here at the edge like we're down at i would say that i think that could be a three inch cut at the side but maybe we should come in at the side and do a, a five inch or an eight inch cut into the meadow and you have a bit of a, a tiered approach because some of the plants kind of favor different heights of meadow that like if even if you look here at the the area that is mowed at three inches you'll find a lot of the smaller clover plants it does allow more a bit of light down into them already that way. the smaller stuff loves that so now, uh, going back to cutting it cutting the wildflower meadow you were saying that you came in with a large tractor and more and mowed it um someone would have said to me one time and i heard my own father talking about it that when you would mow a meadow to mow it at a certain time of the year so when the mower would hit it it would knock all this loose seed back into the ground yeah is that something that you would you would need to do so yeah that is the that's the key is that you want to get seed dispersal so you'd want to leave it as late into the year as possible i like to do it around september time because any later you run the risk of getting a very wet for bringing tractors and machinery in for getting it cut and turned so when the tractor comes in and cuts it he cuts it and it goes onto the ground that's once then he'll come in and he'll row it up where he 
where he turns it so that the machine can come in and bale it. So all that process is actually creating that seed dispersal and allowing the, the, um, the seeds to uh, disperse in the soil. It's not just bees that you're targeting here though, it is allowing cover for small birds, it's allowing other insects that, Absolutely, that, yeah. that are living in it here as well. Big time, yeah. It is, it's not just for pollinators. It, it's, it's a, when you go in and mow these meadows, the amount of, um, the amount of little uh, mice that will be in, in and around them is phenomenal that are feasting on the seeds of the, of the different plants and even the birds coming in and feasting on the seed heads of the grasses. Like it's, it's a really, really valuable asset to have. Do you think though that it's gone a bit that it's kind of a fad. People are jumping on the bandwagon of it to make themselves look the part, you know. Yeah. I jump. I have a wildflower meadow in now, and look at me, and look how great I am. But, yeah, like you know, it's rather than actually, is it suitable for their area? See, this is the problem. That is, is it's very, uh, it's very fashionable to have a wildflower meadow now. It's very, it's in the. Everyone thinks they're the, the they should be should be doing this. Where, and they mightn't have the practices in place, they mightn't have the machinery, they mightn't have the know-how, they mightn't have the, the uh, expertise to be able to manage this area. So very, it's a totally different management practice, like totally different. Like if I go back 10 or 15 years ago and I was working, working with a local authority, back then they had wildflower meadows before, as I would say, it was fashionable to have. So, you know, it's not a new thing, but it definitely like styles of clothes has definitely come into definitely yeah definitely come into fashion like i'd so say recently. i'd say if i did this 15 years ago i'd probably be fired yeah yeah certain places didn't it's not acceptable but now it's it's kind of like if you don't accept it and don't get on board you're frowned upon also yeah i think that's wrong as well like there's certain areas where it works certain areas where it doesn't so there is there's a fine line of being um benefit in biodiversity but at some point you could be potentially harming it that if you don't have the right procedures in place or you're going at it a bit ad hoc you're going to be causing um you're going to be causing damage to the biodiversity because you need to be do cutting these at the right time of year like we said some some places are suitable some places aren't you need to be very very uh, particular in how you go about it and like you said, you go across the country, it's, it's gone bananas. It's gone bananas where people have let areas off that are suitable, but some areas which are totally unsuitable. And as you said there a minute ago about managing some of the weeds that comes into it. Like I've seen some there where they've had mare's tail and stuff like that gets a grip in it. And, and that eats its way across, especially then when it gets cut, it eats its way into it. But the likes of, I see you have a couple of massive thistles there. They're kind of a, a sow thistle here on the ground here. Aren't they they are, yeah, yeah. So I would, thistles uh, up further and I, I, I would, if I had the time, I would go and pull them. I uh, just don't have the time. Them ones, these big ones here, they're kind of a... Well, they, I think they look unsightly. Yeah, them ones there, I would probably lift over it, but... You know, it's you plant them there. And but stuff like if, that. You, if you look closely, there's a lot of insect activity. Like, they're probably full of insect activity like, and... and there's probably a lot of people who wouldn't agree with us digging them up out of it. They are natural, like, and, you know, they're they're doing their part in there again. It's just that they get to the point where they overpower everything else in it. And what's your opinion about the the, the way the, the county councils are approaching it in terms of allowing the roundabouts, allowing every square foot that can be meadowified? Is that even a word? I think some of them are executing it quite well. Some of them aren't because where they're letting areas just go wild and there's no, not even a mowing edge to it. You know, there's, there's some of them are, are getting full of briars and stuff like that. And there's no management to any of that. That's, that's I don't think, overly great for areas in some places. I think it should be a little bit more managed that way. It's fine to let areas off to the country, but, you, you know, we have to remember we're in urban areas as well. so. To, they do need some sort of management. Are they doing it as a as a box ticking exercise? Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose in some to, to get recognition, getting on board with the environment, getting all that sort of thing. I suppose they probably are. I suppose, and and they probably have to. You know, it's, it's 
kind of like the weed killer scenario, isn't it? You know, they have to get on board with it. But this area here is a bit different. Now. What, what happened here? So this is, uh, so we're in just walked a little bit further back. And this area is just been topped with our tractor. So this is an area that has been, none of the, 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 the actual sword has been collected. It's just chopped back Just interest. chopped. But arguably, a lot of the plants, there's a lot of the creeping buttercup, there's, there's a lot Full of, of creeping buttercup, and yeah. some of it's still in flower. Yeah. Um, so like we're doing a bit of a, several different approaches that like, that, like I said about knowing your machinery, knowing, where you can and can't do like it's all said and good letting the ground around about grow wild and letting the grass grow but how are you going to get on to, to manage well, that, it that's it when it comes to things like that you know areas where you've got heavy traffic or you can't get into it i think there's plenty of other space where we can move areas like this into it um but areas where you have heavy traffic and it's hard to get staff or individuals in to look after it probably not the most appropriate areas for doing that sort of thing and it can make them very high maintenance then as well which you know you could look at having someone on a week a week in a place trying to weed it or tidy it up or whatever rather than keeping that low maintenance and keeping them out of the danger of traffic or anything like that definitely yeah we just stumbled across that there about five five pigeons that were kind of pecking at the ground there were the yeah so they're probably picking up this little grubs and stuff that are in the soil like so that's that's what we're saying about it's not just all for pollinators like they're you're when you get your pollinators right and you get your insects right you're bringing in the birds you're bringing in the mammals and then you bring in your predators we're just walking by church spire there and we're looking up, up at the peregrine falcon there which is an apex predator so when you get all these things in place if you get the right habitat in place and these meadows they're probably the most natural thing you'll find uh, a meadow like it's an area of, of cut grass is is not natural no so as we it's, it's it's only down to keeping things clean tidy and managed and that goes way way back to garden design hundreds and hundreds of years ago so i suppose that's where that would come out of but as you said it's appropriate here in this setting but might be appropriate if you live in a tiny back garden you're like not going to get it you're not going to let it go wild like well you can't so, you can't allow it like even you're not going to be able to live in it i was just driving through one of the housing sites in county dublin there last week and one of the neighbors in front of the la in front on, in between their house and the road one of the neighbors has allowed their full front to go completely wild and they have a little border around it and a uh, maintained for wildlife and then his next door neighbor is completely sprayed yeah so there this two there's different approaches two different approaches there to how that's going to work but so you know it's different strokes different folks it's both situation in that case there so we'd be just coming up to a little avenue of trees here and this we both be kind of um using machinery to cut grass and manage things and um what's your opinion of meadows or grasses growing up to the sides of trees I'm just looking here there's one up a bit further has had damage from a mower hitting it and, and strimmers like it's not ideal it's not and i see that a lot on, on roads where where mowers are going along them all the time cutting and they do get damaged i went to a conference in farmley with jeremy barrel the tree consultant from the uk and he was an advocate for keeping these areas loosely mulched around the base to keep the mower out from it to try and reduce the amount of damage that's being caused to them. Like, yeah, you're standing, we're standing at one here. I, I, would you say that was streamer damage at some stage? I think that could be uh, from the back, from mowing with the tractor actually. Reversed into Reversed it. Reversed into it. And that's it's a caught. long time ago though. It's that's a long time, but you can over. see every single tree along this avenue yeah. has had some yeah. sort of belts yeah. with a machine trying to keep the grass cut. And like, if you allow the meadow to grow up to it, you're going to have the same problem when you try to cut the meadow. Well, if you were to use a, a tiny bit of, of the likes of Roundup around it, a, a, just a bare trim around the edge, it means that the mower deck can roll in on that and it's not going to touch the tree. So that's another side to it, which having been out with, on mowers, I found that super beneficial to keep a deck away from the... And how far would you come out? Oh, you only need to, you only need to a tiny bit. You only need to be a bare little out enough, just enough. To allow the deck of the mower to roll around it you know and what's the what's the thought from the 
the arboriculture is a, a point of things in terms of spraying, spraying around the tree. Like our, you hear about uh, you know, spraying glyphosate around the base of a tree. Is it damaging the roots of the tree? Well, grass is a huge competitor because so much of your root system is across the top surface of the ground. So grass is a massive competitor with with the tree roots, especially in young trees. And I seen at home where I planted some birch and the grass was quite long around them and I sprayed off an area, probably around two foot outside around them. And they started to thrive much better for some reason. So I attributed that to killing off what the majority of its competition from around the base. So, so we're kind of, what I'm trying to get at is the fine line between is, is, the biodiversity beside us. Yeah. And, and yeah. So what I have done here is I've tightly mowed the grass around the trees and allowed this as an area for people to come and sit. And the meadow is away from the trees. As I find that when you grow the meadow up into the trees, it's quite hard to maintain and to try and differentiate where your meadow ends and where your tree canopy ends, I suppose. Well, it also looks much better. It looks, you can see that you're you're maintaining it a little bit, that the area of trees is kept tidy and it points out, I think it shows that it's a wildflower meadow more so than if, oh, he's just let that whole area go wild. It's become a jungle as such. Like yeah. if you look over it, we're looking over there at a kind of a woodland area. And if the meadow was to run the whole way into it and the whole way across to where we are, to this other boundary hedge, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between any of it. No, this is the issue, is is finding finding the balance of how, where wild is wild and where managed is managed. And there is a big difference between rewilding and maintaining for, for, for um, biodiversity. Like I think there's, you have to give these things a helping hand. Like there's no, there's no way of trying to fight nature. If you allow to grow into the woodland, like Michael said, next thing you're going to have briars coming into it. You're going to have boughs of trees falling, and you just don't know yeah. where where wild is and where the meadow is. You go in with the moor then, and you're hitting that type of stuff. But I think some managers can fail at that point where you know they feel the general public will be happy with that. Sometimes the general public mightn't get that and they would see that somebody being lazy and not bothering to do anything and where a little bit of management on it makes it look really proactive and the general public can think, oh wow, that's really going out of their way here to try and find a balance between both management and biodiversity. It can be a route to laziness. Yeah, like as as I say, it's it's not it's not from lazy gardening. All this kind of areas of un unkept grass and unkept uh, um, meadows and stuff like there is a bit of there's a bit of method to the madness. Like it, there's it's, you just can't go out and just completely lose the run of yourself and just sit back and sit in the canteen and have a cup of tea. Like it's, no, that that it's not it's it's not a, a an option to or it's not an excuse to use to not do a job. That, that shouldn't be the option. It's it's like you're you're pulling the weeds in it. It's it just because you've let it turn into a meadow it doesn't mean that you just leave it there. Do you think you mentioned there about this being a fad, and this is the fashionable thing now? Will we be still doing this in ten years' time? That I, I'd say yeah, you probably will, but it won't be as forefronted. You won't be driving around the roads and seeing all them little signs stuck everywhere. You drive from one end of the country now, you see these little signs. I don't I think I'd say that'll all go and I think that it, they'll find some other it'll move over to oh the next thing is we should all plant blocks of trees or something like that and then there'll be signs for trees and tree planting area and then it'll move on to something else you know that's how I think it'll go so that's one thing that I don't know if you notice when you walk through here you didn't meet one sign that said this area has been managed for biodiversity no I didn't actually and I'm a bit against that kind of, I feel that we're nearly past that stage. I think we have the public buy-in now at this stage and people know that this is what you're doing. I think, I think there is good public buy-in, but there's no point over signing it because it makes it look a bit tatty, I think. Yeah, I think unless you kind of, you can, I think the one sometimes where you just drive a post into it can, you know, can, it, it depends if it's a new area that you're after doing, I think it's important. But if it's there for you've this here for a while like there's no need to kind of shove it down people's neck as such yeah it is 
it is it's, it's a challenging thing now it is a challenging thing and i've had my battles to get it to this stage it's going to be and for for more people going forward it's going to be challenging but i think as we said there's areas that suitable for it and areas there isn't this is it's very suitable for it here it's like i think for anybody listening if you listen how quiet it is around us that'll tell you there's not too many not too many people down here so you know it's a good area that wildlife can do its thing here where if you were in a, a very high traffic area and made huge background noise you'd know that it was very busy and it's probably going to come into the likes of urbanized problems that i mentioned earlier litter and dog fouling and all them things so right now this is quite a good area for it because it's nice yeah it's nice but it's also i see people sitting out and up there so i i was over in sanctuary domain as well and they do quite similar they cut large trackways through it leave squares then of it and people are able to sit on those trackways and have picnics and all of that sort of thing so every 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 county council is doing it nearly and every public body is is actively trying even the landscaping crews are trying to get into it so they all have a different approach they, different they? Approach. They're all different approach but like i think i i, I apologize if we are rehashing some of the stuff but like as, as we've gone on with the podcast we've we've covered topics that we've only kind of glanced upon and we're kind of looking at going back over a few things like the ash die back last week and now meadows and we're looking at doing more in detail about other things the japanese knotweed is another one coming up so over the next couple of weeks we'll be talking about more specific things more going a bit more depth in about them and since covid as, as restrictions have lifted a bit it's meant that we've been able to meet up in person and get out on the ground and, and actually Put, put boots to the ground and see what, what we're talking about in person and, and which has made us uh, made it much easier for us as well and maybe for you definitely. listening at home it might have as well definitely so um keep an eye on the social media channels uh, i have a, a video there about uh, a little tract of land there on my way home that i was videoing over the summer of uh, how it's been managed in terms of its uh, intensively mowed and then the the council just let it grow and you'd be amazed to see what the results is so kind of check out those videos on the on the youtube or social media channels um and look we'll be back next week with another topic and uh, look tune in and if you want to want us to talk in talk about something let us know and uh, we'll talk about it see you then guys good luck